Hello everyone, thank you for coming to my presentation. My name is Shohei Kake from Nagoya Institute of Technology in Japan. Today I'm going to talk about our work granting access privileges using OpenID Connect in permission distributed ledgers. First of all, I will explain the situation for this research. This research focuses on web services that use, use user data stored in distributed ledgers. Distributed ledger technology, also known as blockchain, is a technology that enables the operation and use of a distributed ledger, which is shared across a set of DLT nodes and synchronized between the DLT nodes. DLT is attracting attention from various industrial fields as a mechanism for managing data without relying on a specific trust point. The following station is set up for this study. The service user is a data owner who deposits his personal data in the distributed ledger. The service provider is a data consumer which provides the service user with unique web services using the data in the distributed ledger. Deposited personal data may include assets, health data, licenses, and so on. Then there are various possible web services using this data. Then I will explain the motivation for this research. When considering such these services, the user naturally sends a request to the web service, which reads and writes the distributed ledger and returns the result to the user. Such procedures are realized by trusting that the web service is accessing the distributed ledger correctly. In other words, the service provider is permanently granted access to the data necessary. In this case, even if the service provider accesses the data without the user's consent, it is difficult to detect. The motivation for this research is how to allow the web service to access a distributed ledger based on the user's consent. Of course, if the web service itself manages the data, trusting the web service is fundamental. However, if the data is shared and used by every DLT nodes, this question becomes a serious one. Before getting into the main topic, we briefly explain distributed ledger technology. DLT is a technology that manages a temporary distributed ledger based on the consensus algorithm. Other figures shows the distributed ledger is operated by a specific community. This community operates DLT nodes and manages smart contracts and consensus algorithms. In other words, only operations that are agreed upon within this community are reflected in the distributed ledger. Depending on how this community is created, DLTs can be divided into two types. One is a permissionless DLT in which participation is allowed freely. And the other is a permissioned DLT in which only authorized entities are allowed to participate. In this research, we focus on the permissioned DLT. The process flow of DLT is as follows. When a user executes a smart contract, the smart contract reads data from the distributed ledger and performs processing. The result is processed into a transaction which is then stored in a block. Only transactions that have been properly accepted by the consensus algorithm are reflected in the distributed ledger. Smart contracts are computer programs installed on all DLT nodes and their processing is agreed upon by all nodes. This ensures that no arbitrary operations are allowed on the distributed ledger and that only the transactions agreed upon by all nodes are executed. Our approach is to validate that this execution is accompanied by the user's consent in the part of the smart contract that accesses the distributed ledger. The user's consent, as described in the previous slide, can be paraphrased as a short-term delegation of access privileges. There are many studies on delegation of access privileges, and the mechanisms can be broadly divided into these three types. Type A is similar to the sudo command in Unix. Then type B is a delegation using an authorization server known as OAuth or OpenID Connect. Lastly, type C is direct delegation by the user using a digital signature. 
these figures are presented in order to highlight only the most important points and the major differences are shown in the table below. First, in type A, the policy decision point and the resources are in the same environment, while in type B and type C, they are in different environments. Another is whether the PDP is handled by a third-party server or by the delegator itself. Based on the above comparison, considering the derogation of access privileges in the proposed method, type A is not suitable for the proposed method because it basically derogates access privileges permanently. In addition, type C requires the delegator to manage a private key in order to issue a digital certificate and is difficult to use in the same way as general web services. In contrast to this, Type B can use OAuth and OpenID Connect, which are popular authorization mechanisms on the web, and is suitable for the situation in this research. Therefore, this study employs Type B and, in particular, OpenID Connect. Here I will summarize the issues of this research. In this research, access privileges to the distributed literature are separated from its execution privileges. The user temporarily delegates access privileges to the web service, and the web service uses the access privileges and SC execution privileges to access the distributed ledger. The figure below illustrates the advantages gained by separating access privileges. Each user deposits data in the distributed ledger, and each web service has SC execution privileges to access those data. However, Web Service 1 cannot access User 2's data with smart contract because it does not have User 2's consent. The opposite is also true. To achieve this, we employ OIDC and JOT to delegate access privileges. JOT is one of the claim expression formats specified in RFC 7519 and consists of header, payload, and signature parts. As especially notable part is a payload part, which can consist of various information such as name, usage, and so on. One example of the use of JOT is OIDC. OIDC is a mechanism that provides user ID and authorization information from an ID provider to a relying party based on the user's consent. The user is authenticated by the IDP and obtains an authorization code. The user then passes the authorization code to the relying party, which uses this authorization code to obtain an ID token and access token from the IDP. Both the ID token and the access token are in JOT. The ID token consists information about user authentication and the access token consists information about resource access. In this proposal, the ID token is used for user authentication and the access token is used for access privileges. I'm going to describe the attack scenario. We we'll consider a situation in which a service user is using Web Service 1. In this situation, the first scenario is unauthorized use of access privileges by the web service without the service user's consent. This scenario assumes a leakage of access privileges. The second scenario is the misuse of access privileges by the web service with the service user's consent. This scenario assumes that access privileges are used in a context different from the context in which the service user consented. For these scenarios, we set three requirements. For the first scenario, we define that SC must only accept a job issued to legitimate service user to use a legitimate service. This is a requirement that guarantees entities on the derogation and the use of access privileges. For the second scenario, we define that SC cannot use a job that has been used before and has been issued in the past. These are requirements to ensure that the use of access privileges by the service provider originates from the consent of the service user. Even with legitimate access privileges, it is not guaranteed that SC execution originates from the service user if the access privileges are allowed to be misused by the service provider. 
Our approach to requirement one is to verify the integrity of the access token using information that can be referenced during smart contract execution. When a service user requests a service, the service user issues an access token to the web service according to the OIDC protocol. The web service passes this access token to the DLT node, which invokes the smart contract. Among the information contained in the access token, four types of ID information, scope, and digital signature are noteworthy. The subject, issue, audience, and authorized party contain the ID of each entity. The scope contains the types of processing allowed with this access token, such as read or write. Finally, signature contains the digital signature of the ID provider who issued this access token. There are three sources of information referenced by smart contract, that is com command, SC execution privilege, and distributed ledger. Command is a processing request by the web service and contains information about whose data is to be accessed and how it is to be accessed. SC execution privilege contains information about who invoked the smart contract. Distributed ledger contains pre-configured system settings. These information are used to verify the integrity of the access token. First, verify that the access token has not been tampered with using the ID provider's public key. If it has not been tampered with, validate that the contents of the access token are consistent. Subject is validated from the information in command to match the owner of the data it is trying to access. Issuer and audience are validated from the information in distributed ledger to match the predefined ID. Authorized party is validated from the information in SC execution privilege to be the same as the entity and that executed the smart contract. Scope is validated from the information in command to match the requested operation type. Approach to requirements 2 and 3 is to manage the freshness of access tokens using time information. In addition to ID information, access tokens contain the issuance time and the expiration date of the access token. The proposed method manages the freshness of access tokens using this information and information referenced from the distributed ledger and the system clock. First, the smart contract checks the ID the ID of the service user from the subject and refers to the user profile corresponding to that ID. The distributed ledger has a user profile for each service user where the last access time is recorded as last access. By making sure that T sub n is greater than T sub n minus 1, the reuse of access token and the use of an old unused access token are prevented at the same time. Also, it is validated that the current time t obtained from the system clock does not exceed the ex expiration time. If the validation is satisfactory, smart contract ex executes the invoked process and finally updates Rust access with the issued at value. This is the end of the description of the proposed method. Next, we describe our evaluation. To evaluate the basic performance of the proposed method, we implemented an experimental system and measured the overhead in terms of processing time and, and data size. The system we implemented looks like this. And the machine specs we used for the experiment look like this. The smart contract implemented for evaluation is a simple one. Updating counter values managed by the distributed ledger with the access privilege. In this evaluation experiment, the counter value update process was executed 1000 times and the processing time and data sites were recorded for each update. In the evaluation of processing time, we evaluate the degree of increase in processing time for the verification of the access privilege added by the proposed method. In the evaluation of data size, we evaluate the degree of burden on storage, 
caused by the management data required by the proposed method. At first, the experimental results of the processing time are shown in the graph as follows. The horizontal axis represents the number of trials up to 1000, and the vertical axis represents the processing time. The blue line shows the processing time for the entire smart contract, including validation of the access privilege, and the red line shows the processing time for only validating the access privilege. In both cases, the processing times remained stable at 2282.7 milliseconds and about 4.8 milliseconds respectively. The overhead calculated from these processing times is 0.21%, indicating that the overhead is very small. Next, the experimental results of the data sets are shown in the graph as follows. The horizontal axis represents the number of trials up to 1000, and the vertical axis represents the data size. The blue line shows the data size without the proposed method, and the red line shows the data size with the proposed method. Both data sizes increased linearly, indicating that they were affected simply by the amount of data increased by the proposed method. The data growth is about 7.884 KB and 6.118 KB, respectively, and the data size for 1000 experiments is 1881 KB and 6315 KB, respectively. From these data sizes, the overhead was calculated to be 22.4%. The test data used in the evaluation system are small counter values, so it seems fair that the overhead would be large. I'm going to explain the limitations of the proposed method. After the web service receives an access token with T sub n, if it returns an error to the service user, the web service can reserve the access token. Since the last access in the distributed ledger is T sub n minus 1, the web service can use a reserved access token at any time within the validity period. Although this issue is future work, it is considered to require a mechanism that can audit logs of ID provider, web service, and distributed ledger. Next, I will explain the comparison with permissionless DLTs. In both systems, the service user has the ownership of the data. However, one of the major differences is the secret information managed by the service user. To call the smart contract, the permissionless DLT requires these signatures made with private keys, whereas the proposed method requires tokens obtained with credentials, such as passwords. These differences make a difference in the recovery against compromise of secret information. Unlike permissionless DLT, the proposed method may be recoverable through credential initialization by the ID provider. However, this requires the ID provider to be a trust point, which is a drawback when compared to permissionless DLTs. The difference in the form of the community is also noteworthy. Permission DLTs expect governance by the community, while permissionless DLTs only expect goodwill of unspecified entities and no clear governance. In conclusion, we advocate writing data access privileges from SC execution privileges and propose an access control method based on user consent in permissioned DLTs. We designed the proposed method using JOT, which is used to securely inform smart contract what the user consents to. Finally, we discussed the misuse of accessibility and comparison with permissionless DLTs. My presentation is over. If you want to know more about our research, you can either read the full paper or email me. Thanks for your listening. Hello everyone, I'm Ke Min Zhang from Xidian University. 
It's a great pleasure to share our work with you. The paper I'm sharing today is Decentralized and Efficient Blockchain Rewriting with Bi-Level Validity Verification. The decentralized blockchain was conceptualized by the cryptocurrency Bitcoin in 2009 from the perspective of the development of accounting technology. Blockchain is actually the result of accounting problems applied to distributed scenarios. It's essentially a decentralized database and serves as the underlying technology of Bitcoin. A blockchain is a series of data blocks that are associated with cryptographic methods. Each data block contains the information of a transaction which is used to verify the validity of its information and to generate the next block. Blockchain technology can be integrated into multiple fields. The primary use of blockchain is to serve as a distributed ledger for crypto uh, currencies. Also, it has been widely used in many fields, such as distributed consensus, privacy protection, network protocol, and uh, smart contract. Blockchain possesses many important properties, mainly including distribution, anonymity, security, and immutability. In this system, all participants have a copy of the ledger for transparency. The identity of participants is either anonymous or pseudonymous. All records are individually encrypted. And any validated records are in irreversible and cannot be changed. However, as a crucial property of the blockchain, the immutability could be a limiting factor for practical promoting in certain uh, scenario. From the perspective of privacy protection, the immutability is inherently incompatible with certain regulations that uh, emphasize protecting your privacy and avoiding sensitive content. For instance, the General Data Protection Regulation GDPR entitled user the right to be forgotten, which means the user had the right to remove private information from internet searches for or other directories. Uh, however, in the blockchain, any data cannot be erased due to the immutability. Moreover, the illicit content such as pornography, violence, or my will could cause lasting and negative impact. Therefore, an urgent demand for schemes of rewriting incorrect contents in the blockchain is desirable in practical scenarios. We focus on the study of fine-grade rewriting on blockchain. That is, writing a transaction instead of the whole block. Most of the writing schemes are established based on policy-based chameleon hash. In these fine-grade blockchain writing schemes, the conventional hash function is replaced by the chameleon hash function, and uh, a chameleon trapdoor is embedded into a transaction. 
user who hold the Camellia chapter could find hash clearance for their new contents, which means they could write the transaction without changing the hash value of it. However, these schemes are still flawed to some extent. Firstly, these schemes rely on a single trusted authority for key distribution to decrypt the Camellia trapdoor, so that they could be affected by a potential single point of failure. Once the authority is hacked or broken down, the whole rewriting system would not work properly. The requirement for a single trusted authority is incompatible with the digitalized design of the blockchain. Secondly, attribute-based encryption involves lots of computationally intensive processes. For example, bilinary pairing such operations require high computing power on user device. The costly operations might affect the performance of these rewriting schemes in practice. Additionally, most of the exciting work is flawed from a lack of verification mechanism. User cannot verify the validity of modified transactions. Meanwhile, the modifier cannot check the validity of rewriting secret keys received from the authority. In order to address these limitations, we propose a blockchain rewriting scheme with useful properties of decentralized, efficient, and verifiable. Now, we introduce the workflow of our proposed scheme in detail. The framework contains four actors, that is, transaction owner, transaction modifier, proxy server, and attribute authority. First, the transaction owner creates a transaction and uploads it on blockchain. During this stage, the owner replaces the traditional hash algorithm by policy-based chameleon hash and increase, increase the chameleon trapdoor using ciphertext policy attribute-based encryption. Also, the owner signs the transaction in order for other entities to verify the validity. Then, for any modifier who intends to rewrite the transaction, she sets her global identification to multiple authorities and receives rewriting secret keys from authorities to decrypt Camellia trapdoor. Please note there are multiple authorities in this system. Therefore, the distribution of rewriting secret keys is decentralized. This accordingly eliminates the risk of a single point of failure. Next, in order to reduce the computational overhead, the modifier would outsource partial decryption to the proxy server and subsequently receive the computation results. During this stage, the computation to decrypt the Camellia trapdoor is separated into two phases and partially outsourced. Therefore, the computational burden on the user side is significantly reduced. Finally, the modifier finds has clearance to perform rewriting, and then 
sign the updated transaction in order for other entities to verify the validity of it. Our paper provides detailed algorithms and corresponding security analysis. For any detailed information, please refer to our paper. Now, let me introduce the evaluation of our proposed scheme. We implement our scheme based on the following environment. We use the Charm library, which is the framework for prototyping crypto systems, and the GPBC library to perform pairing operations. All our experiments are deployed in a workstation with Python 3.8 and Ubuntu system. In order to evaluate the performance of our proposed scheme, we conduct comparison with several blockchain writing schemes. Specifically, we measure the running times of five major algorithms. As illustrated in this figure, the running times are basically invariant with the numbers of attributes in setup algorithm for each scheme. Well, our scheme achieves better performance. For the generation of rewriting keys, our scheme achieves an acceptable performance which is less than most other schemes and is only slightly higher than the scheme of Taylor et al. Figure 3 illustrates the running times of harsh algorithms. With the size of policies increasing, I see that the running time of our scheme is always kept to the lowest while it's presented as increasing functions of policies for other schemes. Likewise, as demonstrated in this figure, our scheme achieves better performance in the verify algorithm. It only takes four thousandths of a second to execute the algorithm with 100 attributes for our scheme. While most of other schemes require more time to run the verify algorithm. Moreover, our scheme achieves satisfactory running time in adapt algorithm with increasing size of policies. As illustrated in Figure 5, the running time of our scheme stably keeps at the lowest, while of other schemes visibly grow. Here, we present some important studies related to our work. The whole literature can be found in the reference of our paper. In summary, we proposed a scheme of decentralized and efficient blockchain writing with bi-level validity verification. The scheme could perform decentralized and transaction-level rewriting on blockchain with a low computational cost. Additionally, we provide a mechanism of validity verification for checking the transaction and the writing secret keys. These properties make our solution have considerable application potential in many fields, such as information governance, privacy protection, and scalability blockchain. Our presentation is finished. Thanks for your listening.